Close. Glad you decided to come. Yeah, hi, Paul. Look, I'm not sure about this. What, working on the dig with us? Oh, come on. We could always use another pair of hands. Besides, I promise you find out more about your Acadian heritage. That's why you came, isn't it? After all, you're an Acadian. Sure, guess so. Good. Well, the first thing we'll do is show you around. And then we'll put you to work. No free lunches, OK? This way. Most people think of archaeology as studying prehistoric remains. You know, cavemen and King Tut. But you can learn just as much about the past from digging in people's old cellars as you can in digging in ancient ruins. But doesn't history tell us about Acadia already? Sure, the bare bones, a little bit more. Dates, places, names of governors, things like that. But there aren't many written accounts of Acadian life three centuries ago. Most people generally, back then, including the Acadians, were illiterate. So they couldn't read or write? Uh-huh, which means they couldn't tell their own stories, and diaries, books, or letters. So much of what we do have come from outsiders, both French and English, like priests, colonial officials, and soldiers. And their descriptions are too sketchy or biased to give us a complete picture. So archaeology helps? Sure. It provides hard, particular evidence of Acadian life structures and artifacts, those we can use to test the written record. And with enough evidence from enough sites, we'll be able to begin to suggest what was typical of Acadian life at a given period. All right, but how'd you find this place anyway? Looks like any pile of bush to me. I suppose it does at first. Most places like this get discovered by sheer accident. But in this case, we had some clues to direct us. You see, the few old accounts we do have about the Acadian colony of Annapolis, they called it Port Royal, indicate that the homesteads were grouped along the marshland. There's still a map of 1710 in the museum at Fort Anne that shows seven houses right on this marsh. So when we went looking for Acadian sites, we consulted aerial photographs of this neighborhood. And sure enough, there were hints of foundations under the turf, visible from the air. Farmers know every bump and gully around here, too. So we made a point of talking to them. The hints from the maps, the photographs, and what the locals told us. We found this place and several more. Take a look. Is this all there is? It doesn't look like much at first. Most of the Acadian farms were burnt to the ground during the expulsion of 1755. Since then, what was left has been plowed away or bulldozed to make way for more recent farms. But just the size tells us something already about the building and the people that lived here. Before we started, this was just a depression in the turf with a rocky bump at one end. Now you can see substantial foundations. From physical evidence like this, plus all the documentary information we can find, we historical archaeologists try to deduce how the building was made, why, and what it once looked like. From the other things we find here, we try to determine what sort of people lived here and how they lived. What did they eat? What did they do for a living? That sort of thing. Are you beginning to get some ideas about this place already? 
Yeah, I think so. Good. You'll find it interesting to compare your first impressions with what you'll find out later on at the end of the day. Come on through here. We have another foundation just about uncovered. But wouldn't it be faster to dig everything up with picks or shovels or something like that? Sure, but the clumsier the implement you use, the more likely you are to damage anything you find or obscure its relationship to the site and other artifacts. So that's why the trowels, eh? But who cares where you find something in the dig? Well, the context in which you find an artifact, where in the foundation, how deep, and how close to other artifacts, can tell you more about the people that lived here than just the artifact itself. For example, we have some needles and a pair of scissors from this site. Interesting enough artifacts in their own right, but they were discovered at the same soil level in the same area, the same sector of the dig. Hey, they must have been used together. Probably, but it's their relationship to each other in the ground that makes that sort of educated guessing possible. Faut bien défaire la laine, Marie Joseph. Surtout si tu veux faire une belle chemise à Flavien. So we can learn as much as possible from each discovery. We keep accurate records of where everything, and I mean everything, is found. How do you figure all that out? I mean, you're digging the whole place up at once. We keep detailed maps and plans right from the beginning. The first thing we did at this site was to lay out a reference line. We call it the baseline, marked by stakes and five meter intervals. Then we cleared all the trees and brush from the vicinity of the site. measure the foundation. Okay, Brian, that's about six meters the interior width. We'll have to uh, run it out 10 meters to get the exterior walls. So that'll be two five meter pits for each side of the hose. Yeah, Even before we removed the first turf, hey, Mark, we were able to establish that this building was 5.5 by 7.3 meters, orientated east-west, parallel to the other foundation we just saw, with the chimney mount at the west end. Then we chose dimensions for the excavation, which would include the entire foundation. We laid out a grid across it for scaling the site down into maps and locating each and every artifact to find as accurately as we can. Each five meter squared is numbered and excavated separately, and everything found within it is cataloged so that at the end we have a complete picture of where things were in the house. And the relationship between different objects. Right. When we do start to dig, excavation is usually very slow and careful, with nothing bigger than trials or brushes. Here, to save a little time, we also dug with hose, reserving the trials for work in tight places. Both of them are much more gentle than hacking away with picks and shovels. I found another nail. Oh. In good shape. Yeah. Got the rosette head too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the soil itself is painstakingly seized to treat bits of bone, china, or what have you that might be missed otherwise.
tiny objects can sometimes tell us a lot. Do you want this corner? Yes. Okay, it comes off the line at four. Got it. At 80. Mm -hmm. Every feature and artifact is recorded on maps of each sector as each soil layer is reached and the depth and composition of the layers as well. Why do that? Because objects found in the same layer anywhere on the site were presumably deposited at the same time. In some soil conditions, like the presence of motor, clay, or rotted wood, can suggest the material and style of the building, or maybe something special about its history. This foundation square, for example, was covered by a fairly deep layer near the surface of a score of nails, lots of charcoal and burnt clay, indicating that the original building was destroyed by fire. And the English burnt the Acadian farms during the expulsion. Exactly. Now you're beginning to think like a real archaeologist. As the excavation progressed, we added a unit outside the walls and a test pit east of the foundation as a check on the soil layers inside. We uncovered the foundation walls early on, of course. They're just loose boulders, though they may have originally been set in clay. The clay, the charcoal, the brick, most of the walling's coming out of that. Oh, really? So the sterile sand has been deposited on top of that destruction level. Only the bottom 45 centimeters remains standing in most places. All the rest of the stones have fallen inside and outside the foundation. So we'll never know exactly how high they once were. They're all of 1.2 meters thick, though, and 2.3 meters at the west end, under the chimney, with a small extra square on the southeast corner. decorated. Mark mentioned that they stopped doing that around 1725 mm -hmm. and switched to incising. Mm -hmm. And you see there's some inciting there too. Yes. That's interesting. It's the first time I've seen the purple on this side. Oh, I think. We also found a flat recess in the base of the chimney that may have been a second fireplace and a lot of rough brick fragments and blue slate, probably from the hearth itself. Now we have to decide what thick foundations mean, Claude. A big house, maybe? Possibly. A heavy structure anyway, one that needed plenty of foundation area to support it. That's the sort of hypotheses we're trying to test with other evidence we unearth, like traces of wooden beams that have burnt or rotted away. See that clay floor? There, by the hearth, we're not sure yet whether it was a cellar or a crawl space, but it was apparently below ground level because that's where it was, there. But besides the burnings, how can you tell it's an Acadian house? Couldn't it be a later one? Claude, that sort of possibility gives archaeologists nightmares. But luckily, we have more evidence for dating it. Lots and lots of clay pipe fragments in and around the foundation immediately below the destruction level. Back in the 17th and 18th centuries, most people smoked clay pipes. And like other common objects, clay pipes change with fashion and technical refinement. So if you know things like the shape of the bowls or the inside diameter of the stems, you can figure out to within a few years when they were all made. So? So when we measured all our pipe fragments, we found that they indicated the period of 1710, 1750. Before the expulsion. Right. We also found bits of pottery that we can date by glaze and material to around 1720, 1733. Same sort of thing for a particular sort of button and a pewter spoon. Though the dates may vary as we find more. Even so, we feel pretty confident it's a Cadian site. Besides the stuff you mentioned, what else did you find? Lots. Most of the stuff 
back at the house for cataloging. But here's a bunch of handmade nails. Hmm. Lots of red clay covered with a fine white slip. And Dave just found this. It's a cider pot. Hey, wow. Actually, we should combine all the things we found in this excavation, along with the bits of information and old descriptions of Acadia, you do get some idea of what this place looked like inside. The nails and charcoal on the foundation walls suggest some sort of boarding, but there isn't enough wood ash for wooden walls. So the fragments of clay probably mean that this house had mud and straw walls supported by a wooden frame. That is mentioned in some of the old documents. white clay would have been used like plaster. The floor above the clay one was probably bored because we had the charcoal remains of sawn planks. The fireplace must have really filled the west wall and the overall size of the foundation may suggest an upper story and the storage attics were common, reached by a ladder. The door would have been on the warmest wall along with a couple of windows. They'd be small though because flat glass was hard to make and harder to get in those days. We only have a tiny fragment of glass that might have come from a window, but we think windows back then were generally covered with wax cloth. But what about furniture, Paul? Well, the excavation can't help us much there. What furniture was left was probably looted or burnt along with the house. But we can guess intelligently. What sources we do have agree that Acadian furniture was simple and sparse no matter what the period. Robert Hale, he was an Englishman who traveled down through this valley in 1731, around the same time as this house. He describes a sort of closet bed for man and wife, reached to by stepping up onto a chest. The children would have probably slept on trundle beds or on straw in the attic. There would have been trestle tables and benches, a chair or two, and a wheel and a loom for making cloth. The stoneware, knives, and spoons would have been in the armoire for safekeeping with a few pieces of exported china. There'd be containers of rough earthenware, like the sherds from the site for bulk storage, and some small bottles to judge from the glass we found. We've got gun flints, so there must have been at least one musket. Probably the fireplace would have been stocked with iron hooks, kettles, and pokers from New England. New England? What about France? Maybe. By the 1730s, Acadians would be trading with the French fortress at Louisbourg. But after 1713, Acadia was British, at least in theory, and the Acadians had a tradition of more or less illegal trade with New England, stretching right back to the 1680s and earlier. In American archives, there are bills of lading which show that a lot of metal goods went from Massachusetts to Acadia back then. We're pretty sure the Acadians didn't have any iron or pewter of their own, so they had to get candlesticks, snuffers, axes, and so on where they could. So they seem to have been pretty self-sufficient in other things. Merci, ma fille. Oh, là, je vais avoir besoin des yeux, par exemple. Yeah. from digging up an old foundation. You guys, you must know everything about these people. Me and my speculations. Everything is subjected to interpretation. I mean, much of what was once really here, it's gone forever. Taken when the people left, or looted, burned, or rotten away. 
we can come close to Acadian life, careful words, and educated guesses. But the next discovery could change everything. Take the houses themselves, for example. We haven't got enough evidence, documentary or otherwise, to say what was typical when. And there are all sorts of Acadian architecture. What about here? The mud and clay walls in this place? Oh, well, that's a variation on what we call charpent construction. That's a wooden frame with some sort of fill. What we call a torchis. The clay I mentioned is from a mixture of marsh mud and hay used to fill the walls. The charcoal is from the timbers used to frame the walls and maybe from the boards facing them. Just because this building seems to have been built that way is in proof that the style was dominant, though. We'd need evidence from dozens of sites. Probably it's safest to say that Acadians built their houses according to the materials available locally and the wealth of the owner. What about the roof? Well, there's no recognizable trace of this one, but generally, some old records mention board roofs, others shingles, and still others bark or thatch. Probably the roofs and the houses generally became more permanent and durable as Acadian farms became older and more stable. We may never know. Okay, but what do you guess? Oh, well, this house is fairly late, about 70 years after the first Acadian settlement around here. So that go for boards, or maybe shingles over boards. With the chimney, we're on safer ground. There's lots of it left. This one seems to have been stone, lined with clay down to a brick hearth. But some of the old reports also suggest clay chimneys framed with wood in other Acadian houses. Was there just a house? Wasn't there a barn? Sure, could be. Perhaps built on piquet. With logs driven into the ground, no foundation. Which would explain why we haven't found any traces of it on the site. It could have been down the field a bit, too. At least we found what we think was the well off the southeast corner. There's what may have been a small shelter or pen for animals, too and a sort of combination pig pen and oven on the outside of the chimney. A what? Well, a British officer writing about post expulsion from Acadian homestead, Napin, around 1795, describes a sort of combination structure used for both purposes. You see? Well, we found it here. Okay, hey guys, it's lunchtime. <laughs> Look at that. Lunchtime already. We'll put you to work after clothes. I know. No free lunch, right? <laughs> right. Okay, everyone, let's take a break. Phew, I'm bushed. You'll get used to it after a while.
Find anything interesting? Oh, not much. A few pieces of stoneware, some nails, pipe stem. How about you? Uh, pretty much the same. But every little bit will tell us more. Keep thinking. One more pass with the hole might uncover something really fascinating. It'll keep you going. Okay, I'll give it a try. I'm hoping we can date this place a little earlier than the other house. That way we can compare the artifacts before and after the British took control in 1713. This marsh is supposed to have been colonized around 1670, so we might get lucky. Why haven't more of these sites been found? Well, a lot of the old foundations have been filled in or plowed over for farmland. Well, why didn't it happen here? That was a weird bit of luck. Follow me. The whole central area of this site was underwater until about the mid-1950s. In fact, the dike here found it part of the drain land. But modern farmers found that they needed more land just like the Acadians back then. So the government expanded the dikes and drained more marsh. So if this site was above water back then, it would have been too soggy for anything but pasture. Since then, it's been so overgrown that the owner hasn't bothered to cultivate it. But surely an Acadian wouldn't live in a swamp. <laughs> no, no, no. 300 years ago, they must have had this ground drained and diked. You see, when the first Acadians arrived at Port Royal, the uplands, were full of rocks and covered with dense forest. Clearing all that brush is back-breaking work with an axe and a team of oxen. Besides, most of the early settlers came from Poitou, where they built dikes and found marshy ground. Poitou? Where's that? France? Right, the west of France. Old shipping records tells us that's where the first Acadians came from. Anyway, they soon found that the marshes here are very fertile, and they were drained and prepared properly, just like home. But if they diked it properly, why was it underwater later on? Well, no dike lasts forever without proper maintenance. And the dikes the Acadians built were only about 1.8 meters high, as high as this recent ones say. So when the Acadians were deported, most of the dikes broke in places, and the land that they had reclaimed flooded over once more. The English planters who took over the Acadian lands adopted Acadian diking, but didn't do it as well. Besides, the sea level along the coast of Nova Scotia has risen over half a meter in the last 300 years. So these lowlands may just have flooded as the water gradually rose. How big do you suppose the farm was? Well, that's hard to say for sure, now that most of the original dikes have been eroded or plowed out but they were usually small according to modern standards. How do you know? Census records. Even that long ago? Sure. They weren't as extensive or accurate as census records today, but every so often, colonial officials, French and English, did take them. And the census recorded how big everyone's farm was? Some of them did. They're kind of like the other reports that have survived, largely concerned with economics, taxation, and defense. How many people, how many guns, how many pigs, cows, sheep, just what you expect from a colonial administrator. And the land under cultivation was an important statistic that comes up in some of them. So in 1686, for example, the largest farm reported in the region measured 12.4 hectares, the smallest was about 0.4 hectares, and the average was, well, let's see, 8.8 .8 hectares, relying for inconsistent reporting, of course. How big is 8.8 .8 hectares? Well, you see those trees down there where Steve is working? We believe he's working on an old Acadian dike. Let's go down there. I'll show you. Hi, Steve. This old dike runs from the upland edge of the marsh down to this natural high point. People call them islands. That's typical of Acadian diking, from high point to high point. Anyway, the land between this dike and the new one we just walked along, up to the foundation, measures between 8 and 10 hectares. So this farm was average? Not necessarily. The two dikes 
could indicate the size of the pre-1755 firm, but we can't be sure. Remember, the new dike only dates from 1951. Then again, there's no special evidence which would suggest above or below average size firm. See what I mean? Yeah, I think so. Diking was a big job, something whole neighborhoods did together. Everything had to be dug by hand, a trench tank or the dike on a marsh, earth and broken sods from the seaward side to make the core. Riveted sods have faced the whole mass. Riveted? That means cut to fit the slope of the dike with the grass at her most. The living sod formed an erosion-resistant wall for the dike. Sometimes there would be a palisade of stakes to the seaward side too, so that the highest tide, about 20 days a year, wouldn't tear the sod and erode the dike. So that kept the tides off the land they wanted to farm. But how did they get rid of the water that was already there? No problem. The Cadians had an ingenious sort of drainage called the abuato, which would open and close automatically. The Department of Highways dug one up a few months ago, so we've been able to confirm the written reports that have come down to us. The whole thing was conserved in marsh mud. Abuato were hollowed logs. One of the ways they had back then of making a large pipe. At the bigger end, there was a hinged wooden gate arranged so that it opened to seaward, but closed against the sluice body on the landward side. It was a great idea. We use the same principle to this day. The completed abuato was anchored with alternate layers of sod and brush where a natural drainage channel ran through the dike. Then the whole thing was finished off with riveted sods like the rest. The drain marsh was supposed to be sweet enough for planting three years after diking. So a guy called Yavid, one of the earliest visitors to write about the Keda, claims it was only two. You know, it's still kind of hard to imagine how it was. Oh, I don't know. Forests have changed quite a bit in the last 300 years. But this valley is still basically the same. Just look out along the marsh. You can almost see the Acadian homesteads spread out along it. A lot of details still have to be left to the imagination, but our dig has given us some information, and we've been able to confirm some of the documentary record too. For instance, census records say most Acadian families had at least small herds of pigs and cattle, and we know the families here did too because we've recovered some bones from the excavations. There'd be grain growing on the dike lowlands as well. Imagine harvesting it as the Acadians did with sickles. Probably as hard work as excavating this foundation is now. We have several reports that good crops of oats, barley, rye and corn, and especially wheat, we're going on Cadian dike land, so we can be pretty sure about that. The mods are put on the Ah, she was. That's a bell for me, huh? Wow, my God. Oui. 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 Oui.
Apparently, he plowed the stubble in the fall and simply howled and planted again in April. Yet the land was said to stay fertile through 10 to 20 years of constant use. We were curious to see how well Acadian farm implements would work. So we persuaded Ross Farm to do some experiments with exact replicas of possible styles of plow. Did it work? Oh, yes. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough direct evidence for the style of plow the Acadians would have used in the 18th century. There had been plenty of time for English-style implements to be brought in as trade goods. But the wheel, carriage plow, used in Poitou at the time of the Acadians' immigration is also a good possibility, especially for use on a flat like Chagrin. We tried both types, along with the black oxen and the French style yoke. But oxen are red. The ones you see nowadays are. But they're the result of centuries of careful breeding. The Acadian cattle were smaller than black. And the Acadian farmer would train any likely looking steers he had as oxen. Lincoln seems to be that it's cutting not quite as deeply as a modern plow. Anyway, both styles of plows work, so I guess we'll have to wait for more solid evidence to settle the question of style. They could only plow to a pretty shallow depth by modern standards, though. That seems to confirm the records about Acadians only plowing lightly on dike land. And if the ground turned out to be especially difficult, they could plow with additional oxen. The clods would have been broken up before spring planting with a triangular wooden tooth harrow. That's technology that dates back to the 15th century and beyond. Rough going, I bet. How long do you think that would take to last? Oh, probably longer than you think. It's just a matter of tapping one out and replacing it. So. Well, let's give it a try. What else did they grow beside grain? Well, most of the old records mention most of the fruits and vegetables grown here today, except for potatoes. There are no known reports of potatoes in Nova Scotia before 1758. There were apples, pears, cherries, peas, carrots, squash, herbs, but above all, cabbage and turnips. They were staples. The family kitchen garden would depend on the size of the family. It'd be near the house, on the edge of the uplands, where the drainage was best. And it was probably the only part of an Acadian farm that was fenced. But all farms have fences. If they have livestock that need to be kept off roads and other people's property, they do. Remember, there were very few people here when the Acadians farmed these marshes. The easiest way of fattening their pigs, cattle, sheep, and poultry in summer was to turn them loose to graze and root in a brush near the house. And that's what the Acadians are said to have done. Of course, that meant fencing the garden to keep out their animals, as well as any wild ones that might come nibbling in the vegetables. Turnips and cabbages kept well for long periods. That's one reason why they were so popular. Turnips could be stored in root cellars along with other root vegetables for winter dinners. Hey, 
Hey, viens vite. On a besoin de ton aide pour les choux. Cabbages were cut and piled upside down in the garden, then covered with straw to keep them from freezing during winter. Then the family just took them as they were needed. Hey, Baz, la du bon avou pour le souper. Oh, oui. Did they have a lot of animals? About as many as were necessary to make the family self-sufficient. Before 1713, when Acadia was French, the Acadians were thousands of miles from France, and the only people they could trade with were their enemies, the English, in New England. The average sized family at Port Royal probably had 12 head of cattle, 12 sheep for wool, and 10 pigs for their favorite meat, pork. By the time of the particular homestead we're excavating here, the 1720s, 30s, the situation had changed a bit. When Lewisburg was built, the Acadians started trading illegally with the fortress, and many Acadian farmers increased their livestock so they'd have some to sell. One thing we hope the excavation here will do is tell us more about what the Acadians raised and ate from the number and type of bones we find. So that's why you're keeping every little bit we find. Will the dig tell us whose houses these were as well? That's not too likely. Artifacts to identify individuals are really rare. All we know is that this land was originally granted to the governor of Acadia, Donay, in the mid-17th century. Then it passed into the hands of the Bogon family, his creditors, in 1679. They sold part of it to a Mathieu and Pierre Martin shortly after. But the 18th century maps of this valley show the Martin family living just across the river. The families in these houses aren't named, only the Leblancs to the east and the Denis to the west. So we may never know whose cellar we're digging around in. I'm afraid not. Hey, <laughs> the others must think we're having a day off. We better get back to work. You know, the more I know what I'm looking for, the more fun it is. An archaeologist at heart. Well, Brenda needs you to work in Section 2A8. Look at this. Hey, what do you got? Please? Take a look. I was just scratching here near the wall, and suddenly there it was. This is a service mounted door lock, probably from New England. You know, we have three English keys. This is a souvenir of a pretty strange relationship. Yes, you said the Acadian had to trade with New England kind of illegally? Very good. France was too preoccupied with wars and things going on in other places to be bothered with Acadia. 
One time, I think it was in 1707, a colonial official wrote his boss back in France saying he'd like to see more New Englanders come trading. And France and England were at war at the time. So is that why trading with New England was illegal? No, wars just made it more difficult. At the time, France and England were both trying to monopolize trade with their colonies so that the mother country could make more money from it. All direct intercolonial trade was bound by both men. Direct trade with New England was easier when Acadia was an English colony, but it was still against the law. And they did it anyway? Sure. Imagine trying to live at a time when most people didn't have some of the basic goods we take for granted. And they were isolated in a colony with nearly 5,000 kilometers of dangerous ocean between them and another country that was always going to war with their neighbors. No wonder they were eager to trade with anyone they could. But what did they have to trade? Oh, furs mostly. But they also traded surplus livestock and wheat. And a whole bunch of things came back in return. Things like spices, dyes, molasses, fabrics of clothes, stockings, rum, wine, tobacco, iron goods like we found here, and little personal luxuries like ivory combs, and candle snuffers, computer buttons, clay pipes, scissors, and soap. But we haven't found all that stuff here. No, but we've found quite a few. And all of them are on a cargo manifest for just such a shipment from Boston around 1700. Sometimes ships and cargoes were seized by both sides. But the Acadians and the New England merchants knew how to keep their commerce going despite the custom officials. So every pellet an Acadian farmer could trap for himself or barter with the Micmacs was like cash on hand for the next visit of the New England merchants. I mentioned the trade with Lewisburg, didn't I? In the 1730s, you mean? Yes, you mentioned it. Right. The fortress was more interested in buying food to support its people than in furs. But that was another major market for Acadian goods when this homestead was inhabited. That trade was illegal, too, but everyone was doing it, even the New England merchants. But the British didn't like Acadians trading with a French fortress that was menacing their British interests in the region. You said they traded livestock. Did they trade anything else? Oh, not guns or things like that. Wheat, salt beef and pork, peas, oats, that sort of thing. The officials kept records at Lewisburg that still exist to this day. And live cattle were important, too. The Acadians were able to increase their herds easily because of the salt hay, and they were probably under less pressure than European farmers to butcher their herds before every fall, too. Don't farmers keep animals over in the winter? Now they do, but back then they had to drastically reduce their herds before each winter because then there wasn't enough food to feed them. But the Acadians had virtually unlimited supplies of natural salt hay on the marshes outside the dikes. Not the greatest father, but good enough to winter a few more cattle if they wanted. And they had plenty of feed to support bigger herds for export during the fall, when Lewisburg came looking for meat, that's for sure. Acadian stored salt hay in burns or on saddles, sort of pole platforms built out on the marsh. They'd stack the hay there to dry, then get it later on by boat or sleigh. Thanks to the marsh grass, they'd never be short of father for their animals. Every year, cattle sat on the marshes, were driven to convenient points on the stumbling shore and the Strait of Cancel to be shipped to Lewisburg. Funny thing is, though, that commerce complicates the bone analysis we want to do. How come? Well, the reason for looking at bones, what we call phonoanalysis, is trying to determine what the family ate, what sorts of animals they kept domestically, or what animals they killed in the wild, and how many, that sort of thing. But suppose this family exported livestock and meat. I mean, they could have. 
Then the number of bones found in the site represents fewer animals than they kept in fact. There are so many variables. We have to be careful not to jump to conclusions. Well, how does this funnel analysis work then? Wait. You've seen that we're keeping and cataloging every bone we find, even the smallest, right? Right. Well, the location of bones is of particular importance because the concentration of one type of bone in one place can represent a special activity that took place there or where once a whole carcass was. Anyway, all our bones are sent to a laboratory museum in Ottawa where experts examine each bone and fragment carefully to determine what animal it came from and what position it had in the skeleton. Every bone in every skeleton has a distinctive shape and structure which are distinctive to trained eyes. And the lab has more than 3,000 animal and bird skeletons to help in making comparisons. Once all the bones are sorted by species and type, the faunal analyst can estimate, at least roughly, the total number of individual animals they represent. So many cows, so many pigs, so many moose, like that. Close examination of the bones can also tell us which ones were cut or broken, indicating that the animal was shot, perhaps, or butchered, or trapped, and which bones were cooked. So we get some clues about what meat the Cadian ate. Are there any results yet? A few, though we won't know much until all the bone fragments have been examined. Remember the Acadian farm animals we talked about earlier? Sure. Oxen, cows, pigs, poultry, and sheep, wasn't it? Right. Well, the fauna analysis hasn't identified any sheep bones yet, which seems to support the idea that sheep were raised for wool and not meat. But cows and pigs are represented, and their bones show signs of butchery and cooking, too. So pork was a favorite meat. It looks like it. But also poultry. We've identified the remains of chickens, partridges, ducks, and geese. So it's almost impossible to tell the bones of some domestic birds from some wild species. They probably did a lot of bird hunting during the spring and fall migration. Ducks and geese. Though just how many is hard to say. The same goes for hunting moose, caribou, and so on, or trapping for furs. We know that hunting and trapping went on, just like the old documents say. But we only have enough evidence to make a general statement. The flints and the old side plate we found prove that our family had muskets, and we've got jaw bones from a fur-bearing animal. Maybe a fox. What about these fish hooks? They must have gone fishing. Sure they did. There's the proof. Also, there are records of modest exports of eel and salt cod from Acadia to Lewisburg in the 1740s, as well as two old counts of a local fishery, but nothing like you'd find elsewhere in the Maritimes at the time. How come? Well, the cod weren't as plentiful in Annapolis as they were offshore. The Acadians only became fishermen when they returned to the Maritimes in the 19th century. During the 17th and 18th century, they were farmers, but mostly they just fished a little from the shore. They were practical people, so they bought some skills from the local Micmacs. Birchbark canoes, for example. They were better suited to fishing and transportation in the marshy bays and rivers around here than the European chaloupe at the time. So they did use chaloupe offshore. And some old reports talk of dugouts for river roads too, though we don't know what they were like. Perhaps these fish hooks were used on hand lines from a canoe or dugout to catch the dozens of fish species available in the river right off the end of the family farm. It was the Nijiga too. Nijiga? What's that? It's a Micmac style fish weir. It could be set up 
at anywhere convenient along the bank. They could catch fish on a small scale without spending dangerous days or weeks on the high seas away from the day-to-day -day business of the farm. At low tide, the Acadians would drive poles into the silt from the high water mark out onto the tidal flats. What you don't draw? Ah, uh, well, let's say longer. On the poles, they'd weave branches to form a sort of fence corral with one narrow entrance towards the high level on the downstream side. At high tide, fish swimming upstream would be directed into the trap by the wall of branches. And if the tide receded, they would be caught inside. They'd catch smelt, flatfish, gastro, shad, salmon, depending on the season, along with species like trout and bass whatever moves in and out with the tide. We found a few bones from the largest species in our excavation, but a lot of the fish the Acadians ate would have been smaller, and the bones were either eaten at the time or they rotted away without a trace. It sounds as though they had a pretty good life. Not in modern terms they didn't, but compared to their contemporaries in Europe, they probably did, except for the trouble caused by wars between England and France. Up until, oh, 1675, Several generations of Acadians settled throughout the valley here in family groups. Then maybe because most of the marshland was already taken, or maybe because Port Royal was too vulnerable to British attacks, their descendants began to settle around the Bay of Funday. On marshland at Grand Pre, Pisiquid, Cabaquid, Chipody, Petacoliac, Pantramar, and finally Il Saint Jean. That's PEI today. The thing is, each successive census tells us that more and more Acadians were farming more and more land and raising more head of cattle, despite neglect and warfare. In 1755, there were 1,660 hectares of marsh diked and under cultivation at Grand Pre alone. <laughs> wow. What kept them going? Well, the Acadian people, like other early settlers in Canada, had a strong sense of community. The isolation kept them together. And the religion, too. They had a strong sense of respect for the authority of the parish priest. And they were all descendants from a small number of families who went to marry. So whenever cooperative efforts were needed to maintain and extend the dikes or set up a newly married couple, an Acadian family could easily draw on an unusually large number of neighbors and relatives to rally around and help. So because they all worked it together, they were able to dike all this land. That's one of the important reasons, yes. Okay, people, it's five o'clock. Okay, let's call it a day then. Give me a hand with this stuff, will you, Cloak? Sure. Listen, tonight I'll show you how the cataloging system works. I'll give you a chance to see more of the artifacts. Great. How about those first impressions of yours clothes? Still the same? Oh, no. There's a whole lot I didn't know. And a whole lot more we may never find out. I just wish we knew these Acadians better. Well, we might have if they hadn't got caught between Britain and France in 1755. As it is, the historians will have to go digging in the archives of France and America. And we archaeologists, well, we'll have to go digging some more old cellars, won't we? <laughs>
par ça, il ne pourrait pas faire mieux que ça, comment tu t'y assirais. Mais ça va, monsieur. Moi?